Hey everybody, welcome to the Twinville Baseball Podcast. I am What A Day Joe along with the player Benny Scholar and we have a special guest today, Dan, the smartest man in the room. You gotta love it, Dan. Welcome to the Twinville Baseball Podcast and today we're talking baseball contracts, salaries, all that good stuff through the years. Almost kind of like what went wrong type of scenario at this point, right? I mean, these baseball contracts are just through the roof. I'm looking at the notes that these are real notes that uh, the player has emailed me. And it was like studying for an SAT exam, reading this stuff. But uh, Betty, I'm going to let you lead it off here. Talk to us. What's going on with these baseball salaries in the Major League Baseball? Let me talk to you. Uh, well, that's, that's a different podcast. Wait a minute. I was going to say that Dan and I have never done a podcast without talking about baseball. So now that we're doing a baseball podcast, of course, the first thing I do is make a wrestling reference. Go figure, right? So I call this episode Moneyball because we're going to talk about over the last hundred years or so uh, baseball salaries. And you it goes from like, a, you know, from a pittance to a king's ransom. But the, the first, uh, I, I didn't realize there were so many excellent resources but um some of this information i got from the society for american baseball research yeah and then, uh, the other source uh is the baseball almanac and then uh baseballreference.com which i mean sure. if you're a stat junkie i mean that's like crack i mean any one of those you can just i can get lost in those things for hours and hours i even wanted to find out the the date of the first baseball game i ever went to and i, I knew that it was in august of 1964 I knew it was against the San Francisco Giants, and I knew the game lasted 14 innings. And oh, wow. so I was able to find the game and actually the box score. Oh, wow. Just, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, you can – some stuff that you never thought, like, as a kid, you'd be able to oh, do. Sure. And you, can just, find every, you can find everything now on the Internet. It really is mind-blowing. But, you know, I, I went back to 1916. So oh, the wow. very first player that I tracked was uh, Ty Cobb. Okay. Tyrus Raymond is Tyrus Raymond Cobb. I think the Georgia Peach, okay, the greatest you know average wise hitter that ever lived. Right, I think his lifetime average is three sixty seven. Had the hit record that Pete Rose broke. Okay, but, um, he led the league uh, in in salary in major the major leagues from nineteen sixteen through nineteen twenty one. Wow! So for that, uh, he made twenty grand a year, and for the last he the last year he made uh, twenty five grand. And just to, you know, and what I, the, the other source that I used was an, an inflation calculator. Yeah, I'm going to say you must have needed that for these bad boys. So, yeah, 25 grand in 1921 would be worth about 382,000 today. And now my favorite New York Yankee, the rookie, uh, the gold glove ant, shortstop, Anthony Volpe, okay. uh, is currently at the major league minimum. The major league minimum is 720,000. So, I, I mean, know. Cobb made adjusted for inflation around half of the major league minimum. I would, I, have shag, to... I would have shagged flies when I was a kid in the outfield for a rookie salary. Jeez, this right? is crazy. Exactly. So, I mean, just as a – here's one of the years, 1917. Yeah. He leads the league in hits with two, 225, 44 doubles, 24 triples, 55 stolen bases, uh, 385 bat, 383 batting average, a 444 wow. OBP on base percentage. Now, what would what would anybody that had to put together a season like that? What would they get now? Oh well, obviously, Dan, your input on this would be greatly appreciated. Um, <laughs> a lot of these look like performance based contracts back then. Do you agree? A lot of them were. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's funny because Benny and I obviously both in you know being money guys behind the scene, and I. It's funny. It's funny. You showed those notes. I spent all those years as a history major, you know, oh, up, up to a master's degree. And I don't think I saw as many numbers on one piece of paper as Benny's notes for today. But uh, no, it's oh funny God. because it wasn't even just performance. It was also secondary. You know, you always hear yeah. stories about Bart Starr being the only person to play in the first Super Bowl that didn't have a second job. There were a oh, lot yeah. of baseball players that would go work the factory in the summer exactly. and then in the yep. you know spring training rolled around. Hey, they're 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 let's play baseball on the side. And it's crazy to think, like Benny was saying, you know, the, the league minimum today is about three times what players, if not oh, more, crazy. back then were making the when they were the highest paid players in the league. It's it's <laughs> runaway inflation and runaway uh performance. I mean, baseball's also making the money. 
No, I, I totally agree with that. And when I look at these numbers back then and some of the, you know, you throw in the inflation calculator in there that we all love. Like back then, there wasn't much to do or go around with or buy. What did they do with this kind of money back then? I mean, obviously, drink it away. Did they just buy car- if there were cars even around? Like, what did they do with that kind well, of? Well, you know, that's really funny because a guy like Ty Cobb supposedly became a very, very wealthy man because he oh, really? didn't spend the money. He invested it. But then you he got a guy like Babe Ruth, who is actually the, the person I wanted to chat about next. I mean, the month. Now you got to remember Babe Ruth's background. He was in a, I guess, a reform school from the time he was mm-hmm. seven, I guess, till yeah. he was eighteen in Baltimore. Yeah, kid, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he had parents, but I think his dad owned a saloon, and Babe, you know, I mean, probably was drinking at the bar, you know, nine years old and doing his math homework. But I mean, they, they, I guess, the fact that he was just they couldn't control him, so they sent him. Was it St. Mary's? I think was the yeah. name of the orphanage, and uh, played played there at their baseball team, but. He was the first uh, player to crack fifty thousand. Um, oh wow! He received, okay. Yeah, he got fifty-two grand a yeah. year from twenty-two to twenty-six. Then they bumped him up to seventy from twenty-seven to twenty-nine. And in nineteen thirty, um, he was bumped to eighty grand. Now eighty grand in nineteen thirty would be worth around one million three hundred eighty thousand eighty dollars. Um, that is about one thirtieth, about three percent of what the current Yankee captain Aaron judge makes today. Oh, and God. Now, let's take a look at that 1930 season. Ruth had 49 home runs, drove in 153, hit 359, had an on base percentage, this ungodly point four. Why can't the Red Sox get a player like right. that? Nah. Well, yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> and, and a slugging percentage of 732, just like oh, God. unbelievable numbers. And, yeah. Uh, they asked them that uh, they made this a famous quote about somebody asking Babe Ruth. They, they, they said, you made more money than Herbert Hoover, who was the president. Oh, wow. And Babe said, why not? I had a better year than he did. Oh, nice. Right? Nice. 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 By the Bambino. But it was That's, true. I mean, guy was yeah. larger than life. So, but these salaries, though. Now, another thing I noticed when looking over this um, this tax bracket that you emailed me, um, <laughs> a lot. it was mainly the big market teams that had these, this type of money. I'm not seeing any obscure locations. Like most of it is the Yankees, Red Sox, might be a couple of giants on here and so forth, but I'm not seeing like that, uh, the, the lower ball clubs spend that kind of money. That's a very good point because if you look at the, the uh, Sabres society for American baseball research, it just lists the year after year, who's yeah. the, uh, the highest played player in the league. And more often than not, it was a Brooklyn Dodger or a New York giant a New York Yankee uh, or a Boston Red Sox. Yeah. You know, it very rarely was in any, anything in the smaller market, but exactly. um, now after, after babe though, uh, salaries kind of, I mean, who's, who's going to follow the babe. Garrett actually was his, his, you know, his crony is the number four hitter. Sure. There, something I, I didn't know till later on in life that when they started numbers, uh, they started numbering uniforms. So it's based on your position in the batting order. And that the reason why Babe was three and Garrick was four is they were three, four in the batting order. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard that before. So Dan, your thoughts. I mean, these are big, this is big money back then. What do you think they spent the money on? <laughs> it, well, you know, it's funny. You're right that they didn't have, you know, the, I mean, obviously disposable income was a thing back in the twenties. Uh, you know, they didn't call it the roaring twenties for nothing. I mean, right. so yeah, so it wouldn't take much for someone making, 50,000 a year to have multiple cars and a fancy house, but you know, right. a box full of cigars, but they didn't have the, the idea of traveling the world on luxury vacations right. and, and, you know, uh, t- a satellite dish in the house. And, you know, I mean, you may have had a prize race horse, but sure. you, you also, like Benny said, a lot of those guys had to be smart with it or they ended up drinking it away or losing it, uh, losing yeah. it to the, I hate to sound cruel, but losing it to the women in their lives. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, Look at Mickey Mantle. I mean, yeah, we were talking about that last week. The movie Sixty One that chronicles some of the off-field behavior of Mickey Mantle, and I mean, the fix was in, right? Paying off. I I wonder if uh, I got to tell the story. Man, you know, if this is too crude, you can always bleep it out. But they, (laughs) I read, uh, I think it was called The Last American Boy, uh, Mantle's biography, and they sent him a postcard after he retired. And they said, what was your most memorable moment at Yankee Stadium? And he said, he said he got the, he got a blowjob under the right field bleachers. 
not not his 500 home run or you know not winning the seventh seventh game of the world. So that was his most memorable moment again. Did he, did he say when he was sober or? <laughs> who knows? I mean, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I know ball players are all that, but ball players usually remember their greatest comebacks or home runs or uh, game winning drives and all that stuff. So, right. You know, you would think that'd be more relevant than uh, a blowjob under the right field bleachers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we each have our priorities there, but now after the babe, uh, Lou Garrett was, yeah. was the highest played, but he never cracked 40 grand. So you went from babe making 80,000 to, to Garrick and who arguably was at least as good of a ball player. You know, the, 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 the bad part was he, you know, he played babe shadow. He, he would have been a mega star in any team he played with. I mean, the, any other team that he played with, they would have built the whole team around him, but, he was, you know, he was, he was Babe Ruth's uh, yeah. second fiddle of Babe. And I don't think the, the kind of guy that he was, Garrick, I don't think he really minded it that much. Because it's, by all accounts, a very quiet, humble guy. Right. Now, but Dan, he, you're, you're a history major, right, Dan? Yes, sir. Okay. So look, think about it back then. What are we talking? 40s, 50s? These guys have agents. Did they represent themselves? Did they just say, hey, play for us, sign on the dotted line, and that's it? Uh, in some cases, it wasn't uncommon for players to represent themselves because contracts were significantly less legalese back then. Right. But you also had uh, – what's the word? It, there wasn't as much um, of what we would consider free agency. Sure. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't take much for there to be a, a law firm in, in New York, and they had the reputation as those are the guys you go to if you're going to play for the Yankees. Right. And you, know, you, you might work a contract and then, Hey, if you play well, we'll give you 10% next year. If you play poorly, whatever. And, you know, so right. you really wasn't a need for these, these 70. I mean, you hear stories like, uh, you know, I'm just, we, we talk money, modern times, uh, Otani this year yeah. made 70 million, and 40 of that was in endorsements. I mean, you're right. talking thousands of pages of contract right. to make $40 million in endorsements. Babe Ruth's initial contract in the Hall of Fame is two, is barely two pages. And wow. most of it is like, don't don't drink and don't eat and drink yourself to a big fat don't death while you're walking around. hot dogs before the game. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, I read Yogi's book and they literally, Yogi would get his contract in the mail during the off season. Yep. Wow. While he was working at Sears, which we talked about before him yeah. and Joe, him and Joe Gargiola worked at Sears. They had oh, to. My goodness. And I, I mean, it was a, a, a windfall. In do, you think they, do you think they ever asked him for like money up front? I mean, before the sign on bonuses kicked in and all that stuff, you think you said, okay, you're going to pay me 50 grand. I need 20 now. I need to pay this off now. You think they ever had that type of sly stuff going on? I don't think they thought that way. I think they no. were so glad to be given a chance that sure. I forgot y Yogi's signing bonus was like, it was in the hundreds of dollars. I don't think it was even in the thousands. But yeah, yeah him and now he, he, a couple of years in his early, uh, you know, tenure with the Yankees, his World Series share, the, the winning, which we're going to get into later, was actually higher than his salary for the whole year. Oh, so, my. like these guys that were the Yankees, I mean, they got they got paid double because most, you know, most years they were in the World Series and most years they were winning it. So they were, you know, right. whatever they made, they almost kind of banked on that that extra check. Wow. You know, it's it's funny. Um, I just want to put it out there because we were talking about B Benny. You mentioned how Gehrig was kind of in Babe's shadow. One of my favorite stats in the history of baseball, 1927, Gehrig hit, what was it, 175 RBIs? And that was the year Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs. So right. he hit 175 RBIs and 60 of his at-bats were with empty bases. Wow. Yeah. You know, so – like I mean, that's yeah. I I think it's unfortunate that he doesn't get the credit he deserves, but he certainly when when you hear like he, Babe Ruth was making three times the money he was at his peak, like that's that almost seems unfair. Garrett yeah, just went out every day and, and he and he did his job. Yeah. yeah, that that's gonna I believe would be a future episode, be the the greatest team of all time, and I think you gotta oh boy, immediately yeah. bring up the nineteen twenty seven Yankees. Yeah, you know, they they they, pl they played the game because they they enjoyed it. Getting paid was a bonus, right? Uh, obviously, not not nowadays because these kids are groomed right from grade school. It seems like, but um, and they, you know, that entitlement factor and everything. But that that entitlement factor didn't seem like it was uh, relevant back then. Um, it looks like they just came, they showed up. They wanted to play. Um, you know, some of the best owners got some of the best teams together, such as the Yankees and so forth, and um, they did what they could with it. So that's that's incredible. Yeah, um, just, just look at these numbers; are insane. I mean, yeah, you know, Ted Williams, nineteen fifty-one. Now, is that post? Um, when did when, he was was he in the Korean War or World War Two? He, he was in both. 
He was in both, right? Yeah, he missed, I think, the equivalent of almost six full seasons. And yeah, six full I think seasons. He hit 521 he yeah. home runs. I mean, and, and he lost six of his prime years. Right. So he might have been he might have been the all-time leader. Yeah, he could have been if he if he took six years off and probably his prime years too, right? If I'm not uh, mistaken. In, in my mind, the best hitter of all time is that man. Yep. Unbelievable. Ted I don't think anybody in terms of like I mean, there's higher average hitters and there's better power hitters. But combined, and his, his eye at the plate, his on base right. percentage, just you know, it was ungodly. But so, you know, speak, speaking of Red Sox, uh, yep. World War II, uh, great Red Sox player Joe Cronin. Yeah, Joey uh, Cronin. Yep, yep. The Hall of Fame shortstop. Now he was in 1943, 1944, uh, was only making twenty seven thousand. Wow. So you went from like eighty grand with the Babe. Now you're down to like almost about a third of it. And Cronin was actually a, a part-time player and the manager of the Red Sox at that time. Wow, they're doing that, double duty. Yeah, a, a lot of them were. I mean, I mean, there were some other ball players out there that did serve that don't get the notoriety because they probably weren't as famous as uh, Ted Williams and Joe Cronin and all that. My other question for this would be: Look at these numbers and obviously how high they are. Where's the money coming from? And we're not talking TV media rights here. We're talking. Pure ticket sales. I it mean, was fa- fannies owners. The seats, I don't know right? where I mean, did the money yeah. come from. That's it. I mean, it was just pretty much. You know, there were no such thing. I don't think there was a thing as a corporate box back then. I doubt it. No, um, you you have to realize. I'm sorry to me to cut you off, Benny. Go no, ahead. go right ahead. I was going to say you have to realize it's not just the the t- ticket sales. I mean, you had you know back. You're talking uh, the cheap seats at Yankee Stadium were fifty cents. Like yeah. you know it, it, what what you had was a lot of. Uh, biz, uh, baseball owners, baseball was a second, third, fourth business for them. I mean, you know that we you mentioned Babe Ruth earlier. Boston traded yeah. him away because their ownership ran into to money trouble money because trouble. of failed investments in Hollywood. Like, you know, you you have no, 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 net Harry yeah. Harry Frazee, right, Joe? No, 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 net <laughs> exactly. So you know, when you're talking, I got to pay Babe Ruth fifty grand. Yeah. You know, or I got I got to pay twenty thousand to to a player. That's not I'm he, that one guy is selling twenty thousand dollars worth of jerseys. Oh, right. It's yeah. you know he's bringing in enough ticket sales, and I'm making enough money elsewhere that to me that's worth it. Yeah. You know, whereas nowadays with the revenue sharing and some of the stuff that sports sure. have, uh, even a, even a a small market team, you know, can can is is pocketing millions. Right. Just on just on other contracts. Yeah, we're we're talking like pre television, and even yeah, like exactly. radio was in its infancy. Yeah, you know there was it was pretty much fannies in the seats. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what paid for their, I mean, their salaries. That's that's the first thing that struck me as odd. It's like where did the money come from? Like like you said, Dan, fifty cents to get into a, a bleacher seat or something like that. I mean, not even pennies probably back in the day, but they definitely weren't making their money off the attendance. Uh, of the fans and so forth. And I'm, I'm not even sure what was marketable back then. Did they sell jerseys back then? I mean, what did they actually sell at the ballpark besides hot dogs and beer and popcorn? I, I'm going to guess they sold, besides the food, they sold programs. And I don't even, I bet just the program scorecard. Right. Was, was yeah. it? I, I can't imagine there's any, you know, if they had tchotchkes back then, I, I doubt it. But I mean, and you, you also have to realize there was a lot of tie-in merchandise that you wouldn't think of. Like, sure. you know, everybody knows the Abner Doubleday baseball card. Yeah. You know, back then, baseball cards were cut out of the inside of a pack of cigarettes. So, right. you know, w- and everybody smoked in the 1920s. So sure. baseball yeah. was getting a cut of cigarette sales or you'd have, you know. I hate to say it, but prohibition, you definitely had some cops that would look the other way towards the the drinks you were selling at the ballpark. For sure. You know, oh, yeah. so oh, yeah. th- there was there was a little bit of money to be made there, but it wasn't it wasn't like I said, there wasn't a massive merchandise market. I mean, that's why you can't go to on, you know, eBay or any of these sites and let me go buy an old Babe Ruth action figure or Babe Ruth oh, jersey no, or no. whatever. I mean, no. you know, you just didn't have it. Nope, that that stuff wasn't out there then. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. So, uh, what was it? Uh, what we talked about last week, Benny, was uh, a League of Their Own. Obviously, one of the top ten movies. We, do we know what their salaries were back then? Oh, with the God. women made those four years when the war was going, or the six years that they were around? Uh, I'm thinking they played for like roast beef sandwiches. I mean, it, it was they were like they. I would imagine it was like in the hundreds of dollars a month. I mean, okay. it's probably just like. 
That's a good. That's a good question. Now you have. I'm, I'm yeah, I mean, yeah, we were talking about it last week. It just popped into my head, like you know, you're going through the years, and like, well, what happened to the war years when, you know, the guys went off to fight the war and the ladies took over for a few years? What were their salaries? You showing? know, if this was Dan and Benny in the ring, I would say I would say <laughs> that they supplemented their income by turning tricks, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, who knows? Um, they weren't making a lot. If if they made a grand a month, I would be sh- absolutely shocked. Right. Yeah. I'm well, not if, sure. if if anybody cares, according to our friends at Wikipedia, the average salary for a, an uh, all American girls professional baseball league player was between forty five and eighty five dollars a week. Wow! So yeah, like three three hundred and change a month, which is yeah the equivalent of about seven hundred to fourteen hundred dollars in today's money. That's about a, that's about a hot dog and a handshake. Yep. Yeah, I'd shake flies for that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. So we got all the numbers in here. When did the change come? When did free agency, when did all this, I'm not going to say small money because obviously back then, but we got um, Willie Mays was the first six figure ball player that, I mean, that's going to be astronomical uh, back in 63. The first hundred thousand ball, her first hundred thousand dollar ball player was uh, Joe DiMaggio in 1949. Okay, so, and, and he was kind of—I mean, he was already at the tail end oh, of yeah. his career. Okay, the Yankee. Yep. Okay. And uh, now Williams, um, let's see, in 1951, would Williams grabbed the top spot at 90 grand? Oh wow! And uh, now, and but and then in 52 through 54, 85 grand. So they're cutting the guy's pay, and wow. it actually reduced to 67.5 in 1955. So just in 1954. He led the American League in uh, walks, on base percentage, slugging, OPS. His on base percentage was five thirteen, which is, I mean, he's getting on base twice a game. And Dan, just, do you, Dan, do you think anything was incentivized back then? I mean, looking at some of these stats, Willie Mays I, like was MVP and all that. Did they get extra for that, or was that part of the contract where you're going to make this X amount, but you got to meet these these goals? Honestly, there are a few notations in history of famous incentives. Benny mentioned earlier, if you know players making their World Series bonus was more than their base salary, but right. no, for the most part, and and I know it sounds archaic now, but like we talked about how the, when you're making, you know, side job money, you're playing for the love of the game. Up until really the 1960s, when you started seeing legit big money. Uh, it, it was bragging rights. I, right. you know, he, he got to retire saying I'm the best player that's ever done this. Or mm-hmm. I, you know, there was a lot of taunting at the bar after the game involved. Right. Right. You really didn't start seeing the huge contracts until was it night? I mean, technically 1975, but right. uh, you know, with, with free agency. But and, Joe was right about Willie Mays. I mean, Willie was pretty much, he hit it in 105,063. And again, even index for inflation, that's about a million bucks. Sure. Yeah. And Mays had won the MVP award the previous season, was the gold glove for center field. Right. And was the was a member of the uh, National League pennant winning Giants, who came yeah. literally within an eyelash of winning that 1962 yeah. World Series against the Yankees. Willie McCovey hit a ball about 900 miles an hour that if Bobby Richardson wasn't standing there, they, they, they would have had that World Series. But wow. Mays was the perennial from 59 through 70. Yeah, uh, was the higher turnover, and rightly so. I mean, I think he was right. I don't think too many him and yeah. him, Aaron and, and Mantle, probably the, the three best ball players. But he peaked at one twenty five. Yeah, and uh, the uh, the only year uh, that he uh, did not get it was sixty six, which was Koufax. Sure, and that was his last year in baseball. He was twenty seven and nine with a one point seven three ERA, twenty seven complete games, five shutouts. And 317 strikeouts. So the 27 complete games for the season is one less than Adam Wainwright, who pitches, I believe, for the Cardinals, yeah. that he's accumulated in an 18-year career. Yeah. Wow. And and even his salary is equivalent to about 1.2 million. What if a guy put up those kind of numbers now? What what, are, what kind of money they're going to get? I I think it goes to what you were talking about earlier, Joe, too, with the uh, with the merchandise. You know, there 
he's a great example because you, you know, you expect Kofax is another one where you can go and find baseball cards, bobblehead. Well, I guess the early, the early dolls, you know, um, shirts that they, by that time, when you're making what Benny said was a million equivalent today, they started having heavy merchandise, right? You, know, right. you could go find, you could go find a Sandy Kofax doll in a museum somewhere yep. or on eBay from a collector. So they, the team started really making money off some of their stars. Now I, I remember gr- obviously, I don't know how old everybody is here, but the first big contract name I remember growing up, obviously and you had it listed here, Dave Winfield, 1981. I was about 12 years old then. And that was that staggering contract, 10 years, 23 million. That's right. That was huge back then. Absolutely. That was absolutely huge. And did Winfield even play for the Yankees for 10 years after that? No, no. no. He, I think he paid, played for maybe half of that. So, I think he got so my question would be, how much was that? Was there even a guaranteed factor back then? I Wait. believe there was, but I think maybe that, like, if the Yankees traded him, I think they were on the hook for part of his salary. I believe that. That I can't verify. Yeah. Actually, Catfish Hunter was the first. He In 1974, he signed – a five-year, three point two five two two five oh, million dollars, wow. oh, about six fifty a year, which like at that time was ungodly money. Yeah. And then Mike Schmidt was the first half million dollar player in seventy seven. Right. Ryan was the first. Nolan Ryan was the first uh, one million dollar player in nineteen eighty, and yeah. then Schmidt was the first two million dollar player in eighty five. And then in nineteen ninety two, the New York Mets paid Bobby Bonilla six million yeah. one hundred thousand yeah. dollars, making him the first five million dollar player and. He's still getting paid. Bobby Bonilla Day. Was that July 1st? Is that yeah, July 1st? 1st? I yeah, he's still getting about 1.3 million. That's winding down soon, isn't it? That was like only 20 years, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's getting there, but they still call say, it Bobby. It's 20, was it 2026 or it's something? Like, it's, it's coming to an end. Like he's yeah. like, got a couple years but left. He, the guy hasn't swung a bat since 2001. Yeah. And for the last 22 years, he's getting a check in the mail for about 1.3 million bucks. I Who like was that. his agent? Right. Uh, yeah, I know, right? I want yeah, to sign, sign yeah. me up. You know, it's, it, you, you talk you talk about contracts. Uh, I remember because I'm I'm significantly younger than than you guys. You know, whoa uh, whoa whoa whoa, in, whoa whoa whoa! How much younger can you be from me? I'm I'm 40. So I'm the I'm the old man here. Yeah, I, Benny, Benny Benny's the fossil. But uh, yeah. you know, we, we, I remember as a teenager in '92, Cal Ripken signed a very incentive laden contract. It was oh, five yeah. year, thirty million. Up to nine year, thirty two and a half million, and at yeah. the time that was the largest contract in the history of baseball. Yeah. And then that was when they they brought in like a couple years later. When you bring in like you know you gave him a the extension, they bring in Roberto Alomar, yeah. and you know here thirty two million nine year, thirty two and a half million yeah. is the biggest contract in history. You just had a record what a year or two ago, a ten year, three hundred million dollar contract. So in less than in less than twenty years. 10 times the amount of money yeah. and never and obviously tv changed yeah of course more teams expansion came in or all that good stuff i mean I, 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 staggering numbers to say the least um oh yeah it's funny I, I don't I hate switching gears like this but i remember uh derek sanderson i'm a hockey guy oh uh, yeah Austin Bruin, derek sanderson, he was one of the first million dollar guys uh when he played for, uh, I think it was Philadelphia. He went to the World Hockey League after he got let go of the Bruins. The Bruins, yeah. And his stories were just crazy. Like he was making millions of dollars, but obviously big drinker and all that stuff. He would walk into a bar and just tell everybody, "We're all going to Vegas," and everyone's like, well, "What should I bring?" He goes, "Just a shirt off your back. I got a plane ready." And that was it. And then they were gone for like a week or whatever. And that's how he threw his money away. Um, but I look back on that and be like, you know, playing hockey. That, that hockey would they didn't make that kind of money back then no but evidently philly and world hockey league wanted a derek sanderson so bad based on the cup years with boston that it, i think it was two million bucks 1972 we made that's yeah and good money back then that's how long was the world hockey league it was it long it wasn't three, that long three Couple, years maybe or like that a lot of guys jumped all right gordy howe jumped bobby yep, howe jumped Howell, yep they all did and yeah um, sanderson jumped so that was uh, that 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 always rings true to me about you know money and you know what people did with it and all that stuff. But yeah, Dave Winfield was the first guy I remember, and then obviously the boom in the '80s, like you said, Schmidt, all those guys. Uh, I, obviously, uh, the fr- free agency was huge. Uh, the salary cap, 
I can't remember in the 80s. Was there a salary cap or was that being debated on with the players reps and all that stuff? I don't think there was. Because it was a big strike in 82 I, somewhere around the 80s. Yeah, I think, I think the salary cap is, is within the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, well, so that, that was a big deal. I mean, when the players went on strike in 81, 82, and um, that was a, a big a big strike-laden season. Yeah. Took a, took a lot of people out. And then they had another one in the 90s. Well, I think, Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead, the – baseball had in that had fallen apart it was the home run the home run chase between mcguire and sosa that actually oh yeah that was pretty much saved there. baseball because it was yeah. there were networks talking about cutting base cutting the tv rights like no one yeah. is watching or caring anymore yeah but um if i may you were talking about um salary cap benny you said that the salary cap they have today Part of the reason baseball contracts are so crazy today is because baseball doesn't technically have a hard salary cap. They have a ceiling and then they have the luxury tax. Well, right, if exactly. Pay, if you yeah. want to pay a hundred million over the salary cap, yeah. great. All you got to do is pay a fine. You know, right. that's why you can get these. Uh, what, what was Scherzer? 59 million he made oh, this that was year. Crazy. You know? yeah. Uh, you Ver, yeah, Verlander and Scherzer were the two uh, top, top. Yeah, uh, you're, 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 you you can get that degree. because teams teams can spend as long as they have the money they can spend whatever they want. So there is, I mean, technically there's not there is a salary cap, but it's on really on paper only. And a lot of that money, and a lot of that money does come from the TV rights now. Um, yes, the expansion with cable and now I don't know how it is with streaming now. Um, everybody's streaming. I streamed the Red Sox right. from the Nesson platform back in New England down to Iowa where I'm at now, and they, it, it's insane. Baseball is unique in that sense. Unlike maybe hockey, I would give hockey credit too as a big yeah. hockey fan. But you know, the NFL, the NBA, they all have these these national contracts. Baseball yeah. doesn't really have widespread national contracts. You have a lot of regional sports. Like as an Orioles fan, I have to watch M- you know, Masson, the Mid Atlantic Sports Network. Oh yeah, um, yep. you know, to get the Orioles games, to get if I want to watch the Capitals, or if I you know, uh, as you get further north, you've got you know so. Somebody like like Baltimore, because I'm, I'm wearing the I'll, as a fan. I'll use Baltimore example. They'll never get the contract that the Yankees have from the MB, the New York NBC affiliate because no. you're talking. You know, there's there's 11 million more people watching that. You right. Know? So right. Baltimore is always going to be cr- uh, you know hard pressed for or t- you know, obviously you just heard what we're recording this on the 16th. Um, yep. you know, earlier today, they can, the owners signed off on, on the A's moving to Vegas. Yeah. So, I saw that. I you know, saw that. Oakland, the, the, the money they were, they were sucking from that contract. Still no, and, still no stadium yet though in Vegas. So what is it, the lease is up in 2026 or something like that. Yeah. But like, w- w- so now Vegas has to press for, I mean, up, they have the money I'm sure, but right. now that's going to have to go forward. But yeah, that's huge. The Oakland A's now a storied franchise in Oakland is now going to Vegas. The fourth city for uh, the athletics. Yeah. The A's and the A's and the Raiders now. Philadelphia, so. then to Kansas city and then to Oakland yeah. and uh, Vegas. You're right. I so. forgot about Kansas city. I was thinking oh, yeah. Philly and, and Oakland. I think 55 through 66. They were the Kansas city athletics. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I know we're, we're talking about football real quickly, but uh, what is it? The um, Chicago bears are moving. They're moving 20 miles south. I forget what town they're going to, but they're they're out of the city now. They're leaving um, Chicago. They're leaving the south side. Oh, wow. But they'll yeah. still be the Chicago Bears. Though, right? They'll be still yeah. be the Chicago Bears. Uh, Springfield? I forget where it's at. It's like 20 miles south, but they approved that. Okay. They wanted to get out of Chicago. I'm like, wow. wow. I mean, I, I, I've, the, I've been uh, in Chicago. That's It's right in the heart of town, but like, I just yeah. can't believe they did that. So I mean, the, the Redskins did the same thing when they left RFK, uh, RFK about 20 years ago because right. FedEx Field is in Landover. That's yep. – you know, that's, that's right. out. That's not in D.C. That's no. part of Maryland. Well, that's like the Patriots playing Foxborough, and that's 30 miles south of Boston. So, right. it, you well, know, about the Jets and the Giants don't even play yeah. in New York. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, my God. I, I can't believe that. You know, we just switching gears again. Watch that weekend that Aaron Rodgers got hurt and all that stuff beginning of the year. Yeah. There was like two games in 12 hours at MetLife Stadium. I think the, uh, the Giants played Sunday night and then the Jets played Monday night. I said they better not do that again. There's a there's a jinx going on or something because right. yeah. I mean two games in twelve hours at the same stadium, two different home teams. That that's like I don't know. To me, that's weird. It's taboo. <laughs> <laughs> can't do that. No, no, I, no. I, I agree with that. It's like having Raw and SmackDown in the same arena. Like, you can't do that anymore. Nope. I don't like that. <laughs> last, last last time you had uh two two wrestling venues close together 
DX drove a tank to, down to oh, the yeah. heart of Norfolk. So, oh, and yeah. uh, was it Norfolk or Atlanta? No, it was Norfolk. You're right. Yeah, yeah. They, Norfolk, they were, yeah. They yeah. were yeah. Nor- Norfolk and Hampton. So yeah. they drove. They drove across the wow. bridge. You think? You think that was a work back then? I mean, come on. I mean, they they have to be in on it. There's Bishop didn't know he was knocking at the door. <laughs> it does. It doesn't get nearly the attention. But back when when TNA was still. Yeah. Uh, when, when they when they were really gaining steam with Kurt Angle and some of those guys, they had a a bit. I'm sorry to go on a side wrestling story, but they had a That's bit right. where they went to a uh, a WWE event just to like, hey, Vin, you know, we're here to show the big boys, blah blah blah. And you, there were people in in the back because catering was like semi outside, and yeah. there there's a blurry face, but you can tell there's a mat. It's a short guy with a mask. Like, okay, you're you're clearly talking to Rey Mysterio yeah, right now, I, or I uh, that. they, they oh, blurred yeah. Eddie Guerrero's face, but he had his his. Uh, um, a poppy shirt on you could still read like oh yeah you know they, uh, they, the, the wrestlers came out because they knew these guys a lot of, and it wasn't until security finally was like oh we gotta we gotta cut this so yeah i guarantee when the cameras weren't rolling half the wcw locker room was out there bullshit exactly. and having a good old time yeah they're, they're all fine. yeah i mean i, I you know I, I have my thoughts on all that stuff i i still think tony khan and wwe are in cahoots but that's just me hey, you never know <laughs> Maybe you know the same wrestling them. right before covid so i think something was up there so who knows? But nonetheless, but uh, yeah, these contracts are amazing to say the least. No doubt about it. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed it. The player, who's the highest paid ball player right now? Is it Scherzer? Well, now, now it was for this year. It was Scherzer and okay. uh, and Verlander. I'm not sure for 2024 who it's going to be. But I wanted, if we could, maybe just to talk about sure. some of these like long term contracts over the last uh, maybe. Well, Winfield got his in '81. Yeah, uh, and, years, and maybe right? like if we think they they actually earn their money, like to me, Winfield for ten years at twenty three million was an absolute steal. Sure. And then Jeter in two thousand one was a ten year one hundred and eighty nine million. So you know eighteen point right. nine million. Um, I, I think he definitely earned that contract. I mean, I I'm not going to say that about too many of these. I think, and here's one I think we can all agree on that Albert Pujols. Yeah, pool uh, holes big happen. back then. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, ten in 2012, 10 years, two hundred and forty million dollars. And his prior, if you look at his first, I guess eleven seasons with the Cardinals, right? I mean, the guy. I mean, he was crushing, and the guy was averaging probably forty homers, um, one hundred twenty-five RBIs. I think his career average was like about three fifteen. And then over the next ten years. Because I, I I'm a stat guy, obviously, and I just watched his his batting average slowly. I thought, like, you know what? If this guy keeps it up, he's going to end his career under 300. And sure enough, he did. I mean, what yeah. a career the guy had. I mean, 700 and what at 704 home runs, I think he's got. I mean, just unbelievable. But you still look at these contracts, though. But how much of it is guaranteed, though? Like when you sign, what check does he get that next day? I, that- I think and Dan can correct me. I, I think unlike football, I think a lot in a, a baseball contract. Right. It's pretty much guaranteed money. If they if they cut you, I believe they have to you still pay, get paid. Pay you rather, and uh, yeah, I mean, some contracts will have exit clauses. You saw that with uh, when when they when the the Mets signed uh, Scherzer and Degrom at the same time, right? Because you know, that's what eighty, almost ninety million between the two of them. Um, you know, and then to answer your question, Benny, next next year Scherzer is making forty three million next year, which I think okay. is the highest too. So, okay. um, but. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, m- most most major league baseball contracts are pretty much guaranteed. That's why you'll see a lot of the contracts will get backloaded. You know, right. t- we'll give you ten year, a hundred million, but forty million of that is year ten because we know you won't be here. Right. So we, yeah. by then you'll be retired, or we'll trade yeah. you, or whatever, and we won't have to pay some of that money. I right. know, I know, there are still uh, checks. Manny Ramirez is getting from the Red Sox, not a lot, but we're still paying him a, a decent amount. If you open your um, mailbox and, and there's money in it, it's a, it's a good day, but. I mean, yeah. what, what were the Angels thinking, though? I mean, the guy, now Pujols, and it's, <laughs> nobody, it's one of these guys that nobody really knows how old he is, but <laughs> he, uh, uh, you know, on MLB.com, he's listed as 1980. So when he signed this deal in 2012, he's 32. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're signing a 10-year deal. What, what's your productivity going to be by, like, say, year five, year six? And that's got to play That's gonna play a role somewhere, though. You know you're going to be on the downside. I mean, like, what what's... Who, who's going to think that at 41, Albert Pujols is still going to be mashing, you know, 43 homers, driving in 130 runs? Nobody's going to do that. But I, did, is any of this incentivized too as well? I mean, I, mean, I don't think so. I think this was just, you know, I mean, he he made, he made that dough. And I mean, here's a bust, I, at least I think. Uh, Giancarlo Stanton, 
2015, oh, 13 years, $325 million. I think the guy hit 190 last year. <laughs> and and he's missed, I think, since he's been with the Yankees. I'm not sure if it's since he's been with the Yankees or his whole career. He's missed 36% of the games that he's supposed to play. Was, so, that, I mean, a, was that a Cashman signing? Yes. It was. Okay. It was. But, I mean, what job can you, you know, show up for work 64% of the time? Oh. And then when you show up to 64% of the time, yep. you do shitty work. I mean, how, yep. how long are you going to have a job? But this guy, oh, you know, he's I know who gets that. Med- meteorologist, they get that. Right. <laughs> what are they right? 37% of the time on a 365 day average? You go to college for four years to get a degree in meteorology so you can guess the weather like everybody else. <laughs> you know what? I... I'm going to have to disagree with you, though, Benny. My personal opinion, and this is just the money side, um, the really modern times, the worst contract, you got to go with Strasburg and the Nationals. I mean, yes, he retired, which saved them money after his carpal tunnel, but, you know, $35 million a season, and wow. he he w- he was one in four before he went down for, for his surgery and never played again. Based on the guarantees, that one win cost the Nationals $105 million. Jeez. So, you know, you, you I mean, I, I, you'd be hard pressed. I, even as an Orioles fan, thinking how bad the Chris Davis contract was, which is, I think, one of the worst of the last decade. He had, he had one good year, right, Davis, right? He, he was smashing home as well. He, he put on a show at Fenway one, Park one time. One, he had one year that it's yeah. like, if that was every season, you're a Hall of Famer. And he sure. had a couple of like, damn, this, you know, like the, the crush nickname, like, hey, this guy might hit. Right. But I mean, at that at one, you give him this massive contract extension, and within a year and a half, he's setting records for strikeouts and leading the league in in you know uh, what what was what was it? It was uh, swings per hit or oh, something God, like. Yeah. Like it was just how bad he was. You know, still getting and, paid though. Still, you know what paid. he he got a Bob Davis got a Bobby Vanilla style contract yeah. where he's he a lot of his money is deferred and the Orioles aren't even going to start paying him some of it. I think it's like twenty thirty, and then oh he's going to get a check every year for a few seasons. You well, know, now typically the pitchers aren't getting the the longer. Like uh, I don't know what Strasburg's deal was in terms of number of years, but. I mean, how about Jacob Degrom signed a? Uh, I always say he's the poster boy for Vagisil. He's just a, <laughs> he's a sissy, right? But I, I think it's five years, one hundred and eighty-five million. The Rangers signed him for, and um, he what he pitched maybe I don't yeah. know ten games. Now you say he's the poster he, boy for Vagisil. Is that because he puts the oil on his glove or his cap, or is that no, because, a because he's he's a, ba- he's a he's a baby? <laughs> but well, you, you know what he is. I but agree. I mean, and they show a picture of him posing with the World Series trophy. He's like, "You didn't win that. Like, give that, give that to somebody who actually busted their butt every day." Yes, yes, that's that's the uh, the equivalent. You hear stories about you know some random player that you've never heard of that has yeah. three Super Bowl rings because he's he yeah. was a fifth string at the right place yeah. and right time. Oh, the Patriots yeah. got plenty of those guys, practice yeah, squad why? guys, all this stuff, and why? you don't find out they have the three rings or four rings until they go into the the studio and they're you know they're on some random talk show, right? Oh, four times Super Bowl player, and I'm like going, who is that? <laughs> oh yeah, let me look him up. Oh, practice squad. Okay, yeah. made two appearances in the playoffs, and that was it. Right. So, yeah, I definitely hear you there. But I can't <laughs> yeah. see. I mean, with the, with as fragile as frail as these pitchers are, I mean, yeah. giving any pitcher a long term contract, well, I think, is a crapshoot. That that goes to what I was saying. Strasburg's contract was seven year, two hundred and forty five million. Yeah, and he was already like this. This good season he had was a miracle because you already knew he was injury prone. So, right. Well, and same with Degrom. I mean, Degrom had a couple of seasons where he didn't even pitch ten games or yeah. throw you know fifty innings. What are they thinking to so, give this guy this kind of money? Here's a good question, mixing it up a little bit. Position wise, who's the most pitchers, catchers? I mean, Ortiz was a great ball player, big poppy, but he was a DH, mm-hmm. made good money. So if you had to look at some of these stats now, is it the pitcher that makes the most money, or is it the hitter now? Is it the does it go by position? Like if you had to really put it all together. I think the I think the um, pitchers can make the most money per season, but they're less likely to. Like here's an example: Fernando Tatis uh, signed a in 2021 a 14 year contract for 340 right. million dollars. So it's not that much on a per year basis. Not that it's Trump sure. change, but I mean for 14 years, Mookie Betts 12 at 365. So that's about 30 mil. Trout was 10 at 36. I think Aaron Judge is what nine years. 
at 360. So he's 40 million a year. Mm-hmm. I still have no idea why the Red Sox let Mookie Betts go. It's right. Just, yeah, exactly. And that all happened during COVID, and they were going to try and nullify the contract, and they let the best player in baseball go. And I still scratch my head off that. I just don't well, get it. I don't know how it happened, but um, it's, mean, just, not, it's insanity. Not, not to not to kick the Red Sox while they're down, but I mentioned Strasburg, I think, is the worst contract in, in your recent memory. Sure. A very close second has got to be Boston's contract with Chris Sale. I mean, he oh. he, he pitched what half half I think it was like half an inning before his Tommy John surgery. Going back to 2018 when he wanted, he was still on the shelf half the season. Yeah. Um, even before then, he his season would wrap up in August because there was an injury coming. I I didn't see what the he was great in 2018 when we needed him. After that, I don't think he's played a full season. He no, has. I don't think he's played a full season. I, 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 they threw some numbers out earlier this year. I, right. I want, I for, I'm just trying to remember. I want to say it was something like since he signed the contract, he's only pitched. Uh, it was light, It was 48 innings, 47 innings, something like that. Yeah. It was less than 50, which amounts to Boston paying him 18 million dollars a win. Yeah. So, you know, I, mean, honestly, I honestly think what happened with him happened with Pedro Martinez because when Pedro lost his velocity on his fastball and he started getting injured, he had to mix mm-hmm. it up. So in yeah. 04, when Pedro wanted, Pedro wasn't Pedro in 04. He was kind of like the fastball singer, all that. Right. Chris Sale was 100 miles an hour, 99, all the time. And as you could tell he couldn't throw that anymore, so he had to rely on the breaking ball. And that. I just think he had a tough time adapting to that, and that's probably why the injuries happened because his body was breaking down on him, obviously, because it, I, I was at a Red Sox game one time, and all of a sudden he just left the game. We were like, mm-hmm. well, what happened? Like, what happened there? Like, you just left? Okay. We, yeah, we wouldn't know until later on. Oh, he's got arthritis going on. He's on the shelf now. And it's like, what? Well, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, too. Wasn't his first, I want to say season ending, but wasn't his first major injury? He he fractured a rib. Yeah. With, yeah. with a throwing motion. Like in the, in pitch, the middle yeah. of the pitch, he just hunched over. And yeah. it's like, well, you know. You, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, and it's he's been, a, I hate to say it, but he's been a problem since that. I mean, 2018, don't get me wrong, get a great year. I mean, he was that guy that pitched game one, game three, and then he came in to close it out in what a game we beat the Dodgers in. But after that, I, I don't think he put, I don't think he pitched more than 10, 12 games a year. It was just, it was, yeah. he was always late after spring training. They shut him down. He'd begin spring training in May or, you know, vice versa. It was just, it was just right. an experiment. Yeah. I agree with you, Dan. I'm a Boston guy. That's the worst <laughs> contract. You know, speaking of Boston and Joe, I brought this up last week. Yeah. Uh, I want to bring it up again and maybe not just him, but, you know, a guy like Yaz, who's probably about 83, 84. You yeah. got a guy like Koufax. I think Koufax is probably 87 or 88. 88. Yeah. Willie, Willie's 90. Maybe you got a guy like Mike Schmidt, who's maybe 72, 73. What are these guys who were like, I mean, the, the stats they put together are mind boggling. What do these guys think of the kind of money that the guys now are getting? There's got to be some envy right there somewhere. Has to be envy. Yeah. I, I can't, I mean, yes, Triple Crown, 67. Uh, Schmidt with a big contract, all that stuff. I mean, there's got to be some type of envious, but like we talked about, I don't know how their pension scale works. So if there's more money in the league, does their pension get higher as you know, cost of living? And all I'm, that I'm sure they get. Yeah, I'm sure it gets. In so, I mean, year. they're probably not complaining. Uh, obviously, they're ambassadors to the sport. Uh, Yaz comes to Fenway, pops in the booth now and then. He's always promoting the product, the game, the whatever. So they're on that type of behavior. But, yeah, the only way you're going to figure this out is if you run him at, run into him while he's out to dinner and sit down and be like, hey, what do you think of shares are getting – X amount well, of money this year and all that. What are your thoughts? He I mean, if, if, if bum, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if a guy, if Verlander and Scherzer are making forty three million, if you look at Koufax's like last four seasons, yeah, he he had to be a hundred million dollars a year with the kind of stats he put up. Yeah, I, I, I in, in the in the other flip side of the argument, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but won't the old guy versus the new guy say, well, the game has changed, it's different now, there's more pressure, there's more this and that. What do you think? Yeah, you always hear that. It's the same thing with play. You know, when, when you they talk about football is a great example where it's like, oh, you know, Tom, Tom Brady wouldn't last two weeks in in the era Joe Montana played in, or you know, where uh, I even and and Benny and I, like he said, we always talk about baseball when they mention somebody like a like a Sandy Koufax. Yeah, he wouldn't last a week pitching against some of the hitters today, which I think is ludicrous. But um, 
you know, you always get that. The problem is, is that when you see someone like a Mike Schmidt, like a Cal Ripken, yeah. like a Kirby Puckett, somebody like that, who I have no doubt would be an all-star in today's game, making sure. 5% what the players make today. I would be frustrated if that was me, yeah, even yeah. someone like a, like a Ripken or Rand sure. Johnson who are, are, you know, worth tens of millions of dollars yeah. and their, their great grandkids are going to be fine because they were yeah. smart with their money. I, it's got to be frustrating. It has well, to be. And, and like a guy like Koufax, like I said, he threw 27 complete games in 1966. These guys making 43 million. I mean, they're pitching six innings. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and they just lowered the cutoff not that long ago. You can get a win if you yeah. pitch four of uh, one out more than four innings. So I mean, oh, you really? See, oh, wow. Yeah. You you see you see pitchers today getting pulled in the fifth inning. Yeah, and getting still the, get win. the win. Like yeah, yeah. they got they got one or two outs in the fifth, and then they get the win. It's like yeah. no, no, no. And then it the used argument to be six, the, seven deep. You know, right. and then, then the now. Then the argument to that is, oh, the games are longer now or the yeah. seasons are longer and all that stuff. But I know we touched upon this, Benny, last week, but 86, I went to Fenway Park, Sox, Oakland, and I got seats behind home plate. And I knew the game was changing when Consengo and McGuire got up. And I saw these two Bash brothers handling the baseball bat like it was a wiffle ball bat. And McGuire and Consengo, I think Consengo did hit a home run. McGuire struck out, but he was hitting foul balls that were probably still in flight by the time I left the ballpark. Um, I knew the game was changing then, uh, whether it was steroids, whatever, but they weren't your 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 idols growing up, so to speak. They, these guys were big monster baseball players and athletic, obviously, because uh, they hit home runs and they stole bases. But that did the game was different then, that's for sure. I think the game actually changed in the late 60s when Herman Munster tried out for the Dodgers. And uh, he, knocked, <laughs> he knocked the scoreboard off the, off its hinges with a home run. Yeah, I think that – but, no, I, I, I agree with you. That that was pretty much it. Like, when once you saw – Everything changed. It was like – Yeah, I mean, you had guys like – I mean, um, Richie Ashburn. I'm, I'm trying to think. Like, you know, Fred Lynn. Fred Lynn wasn't a big guy. No, was, he was, was my he, favorite growing up. Was but he, he was a hustler. Ten? He was a scrapper. He well, was, he, you know. Steve Garvey he, wasn't a big guy. Steve Garvey yeah. was 5'10". I mean, he yeah. had the Popeye forearms. None of these guys were giants, but like Mc, no. McGuire. I mean, there's Paul Bunyan. Well, I mean, we, he was we, huge. Unfortunately, history has taught us why Mark McGuire looked the way he did, though. But he took them when they were legal. <laughs> and he sure. testified under oath, unlike just, everybody just, else, namely just, Clemens. Just like Raf, Raphael Palmero never uh, – he got a tainted B12 shot out of Miguel Tejada's uh, double hate bag. I hate it when that happens. Yeah. You know, and Benny, I, I got to disagree with you. Uh, it wasn't the 60s with Herman Munster. Baseball changed forever in the 90s. You had you had a kid with a bad shoulder becoming an all-star pitcher. Uh, don't forget that that that, oh, that kid that year? owned the Minnesota Twins for a little while, and then oh, yeah. when the Angels won the pennant with actual Angels in the outfield, that's, that's right. got to be cheating at that point, <laughs> including Matthew McConaughey, right? Well, one of the uh, one of the smallest players I we were overlooking is definitely Kirby Puckett, not a very big man. There yeah. is a Tony Gwynn, Al, not a Al, big Al guy. Albie you know? Pearson played for the Angels in the sixties. Was five foot three. Oh my God, that's yeah. like Freddie Patek, Angels, right? Oh yeah, Freddie Patek, yeah, same, same right? thing. Well, I went to a Red Sox game. Uh, Angels were routing the Red Sox. It was like 21 nothing. Freddie Patek was getting up, ready, getting ready to hit his fourth home run, and we all gave him a standing ovation in Boston. It was great. I, I looked at him at home plate. I'm like, God, that guy's small, but boy, could he hit a baseball. <laughs> right. Patek hit three home runs in one game? He uh, almost hit four. It was Holy back in, I want to say, early 80s. Wow. Yeah. They were booing the Red Sox and cheering the Angels. That's well, how bad it was. I mean, just – you know, you talk now, just uh, uh, what's his name? Um, in Houston, uh, Altuve, Altuve. he's like oh. five five or something. Oh, yeah, well, he's a small guy, yeah. yeah, but he's like an all or nothing ball player, too. Either he's hitting the game winner or he's not, and that's yeah, that's where I think the game has changed now. If you need a base hit to win this game, or we can always get into this uh, this argument, when do you bunt? Why don't they bunt anymore in, in baseball? Isn't the object is to advance the runner to get that run home? Nobody bunts anymore. It's insane. And I think that's the incentivized contract part of it. You put these guys in that position, the owners want to see a home run because home runs make money and home yeah. runs win games and home runs. People like the offense as opposed to the defense, I guess. What amazes me is you have guys who can strike out 125 times and still hit a 300, which was unheard of right. you know, 30 years ago. 
because they're at bad percentage is probably obviously much higher than it was 30, right. 40 years ago. Sure. You're, you're up five, six times a game now, as opposed to three or four. Well, I and, mean, and oh, I'm sorry, I, mean, I thought you were finished. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, especially now with, I mean, and it don't get me started on how irritated I was seeing one in the world series, but now, now that they're running what they call bullpen games where you'll, oh. you'll pitch six or seven people. Each pitcher plays about an inning, inning and a half, yeah. maybe, yeah. maybe two, if you're lucky, um, you know, it, so it doesn't take, and again, no disrespect. These guys are better than I'll yeah. ever be in my, even in my wildest dreams. Yeah. But when, when you, when you play the bullpen That's once a week for the season, you're going to have a, you know, it doesn't take much. Like you were talking about with, with Boston or, or seeing the Yankees or what the Yankees in Baltimore had a game, yeah. uh, or excuse me, the Boston and, and Baltimore had a game. The final score was always like thirteen to twelve yeah. with sixty hit. It was it was the fr- uh, the first time in Major League Baseball history a team had won a game after giving up wow. over 20, 25 hits or whatever it was. Wow. You know, you you had something like sixty hits in the game because you're playing you're playing the closer in the fourth inning, and then you know you're you're deep into the bullpen five six innings into the game. You're playing. Sure. Again, no, no disrespect to their talent, but you're you're playing the worst pitchers the team has by yeah. this by the sixth, seventh inning. Well, that's how the Red Sox won it in 2018. It was getting frustrating after a while because Chris Sale would go four innings, five innings, and every inning it was a new pitcher mm-hmm. or every batter. It was always a game of matchups, and it was almost like clockwork. And it was like I think that's why the pitch clock came in now because obviously the Yankees Red Sox games lasted like eight hours a night, right? Um, but that's how they won in 18. It was you know, who's coming up, how's it rotating, and it was always bullpen action. And you just knew that whether it was Dice K or whatever back in the day, it was always – they weren't going more than four or five innings. If they, if they did go more than that, it was Kurt Schilling, I think, pitched six innings against the Yankees in the ALCS. And that was like we were God smacked with the bloody sock and like, oh, my God. Yeah. And then, you know, Derek Lowe and all those guys would come in. But I – 2018, I agree with you there. It was always whoever was coming up, they were facing this, you know, this pitcher or whatever. So, yeah, the bullpen games now, it's yeah, it turns me off kind of, but right. Well, commercials make money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, so all right, guys. So, we've been talking uh, baseball contracts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want to thank Dan, the smartest man in the room. He is the smartest man in the room. The player, you didn't tell me that Dan was the smartest man in the room. It's a well kept secret, but now you know. It's a well kept secret. Okay. I want to thank you both for coming on here, the Twin Bill Baseball Podcast. Any final thoughts from you guys? Well, I mean, it just, I think we've like literally touched just the tip of the iceberg as far as like topics oh, yeah. we can we can talk about. I mean, I thought of maybe, you know, greatest teams of all time. I thought of like while we were just chatting, I thought like the value of maybe analytics versus yeah. just, you know, gumshoe. We gotta do a favorite history. ballpark one too. Favorite oh, yeah. ballpark. Oh yeah, historic ballparks. Historic absolutely. Ballpark. How how long of a show do you need to say Camden Yards and then that's it? So <laughs> right. I loved Camden Yards when they first opened. I loved that backdrop and everything. Oh, absolutely. Like, that's a bucket list for me. Still hey, oh, unbelievable. Yeah. I, I'm just grateful. It's been, it's been a couple, what Benny, I think our old program. And so it's been a couple years since I've been able to crack out the, the smartest man in the room moniker. So it was nice to you know a nickname. I visit an old friend. Nice. Nice. But we got to be careful talking contracts though. We talk too much money. Benny's going to want to raise. No kid. This is like a tax bracket. This is like taxes <laughs> right here, Benny. I, I went to print this out. I'm like, it won't stop printing. Like what's going on here? <laughs> I, I just wanted enough money to upgrade from bologna to pork roll. That's, that's oh, all there I'm you saying. go. There you go. Get some bread in a can. You'll love that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm one a day Joe with the player and Dan, the smartest room, the smartest man in the room. I want to thank everybody for coming on to the Twin Bill Baseball Podcast. Of course, you can tune into the baseball podcast wherever you get your uh, YouTube as well as Facebook. And, of course, wherever you find your podcasts and all that stuff. So thanks a lot, guys. You have a good one. Take care. All right. Take care. Thanks.